Hello and welcome to the Scottish Wildlife Trust's Take a Closer Look. My name is Nick Wright and today we're going to be taking a closer look at beavers. Now beavers are rodents, uh, in fact they are the world's second largest rodent, the largest being the capybara, and there are two distinct species that are recognised and widely distributed across the northern hemisphere. Those being Castor canadensis, the North American beaver, and Castor fiber, the Eurasian beaver. And within that there are up to 10 subspecies or geographical variants recognised. But today we're going to be focusing on the Eurasian beaver. With large robust bodies, rounded heads bearing large front incisor teeth, and a paddle tail, beavers are instantly recognisable. So let's take a closer look at the beaver. The average adult beaver weighs around about 18 kilograms, that's 18 bags of sugar if you like, and can grow to a length of 1.5 metres, so a fairly sizable beast, from tip of the nose to the end of the tail. Beavers are semi-aquatic um, and spend most of their time in or adjacent to water. And as a result, they exhibit some remarkable adaptations to an aquatic lifestyle. So let's take a closer look at some of those adaptations. Beavers' ears, nose and eyes are held high up on the head, are placed high up on the head, so that means that they can be held out of water when they are swimming. Beavers also have a third eyelid or nictating membrane, so when they're swimming underwater, this can come across and protect the eye and also enable the beaver to see underwater. Other adaptations such as reduced heart rate and efficient lung capacity means that the beaver can spend up to 15 minutes underwater. Its hind feet are webbed, which help it in swimming, propelling itself along. And of course it has that fantastic paddle tail, which can be used as a flipper for projection or an oar for direction. The tail also doubles up as a fat storage organ um, and if a beaver is alarmed, it can slap the water with its back tail, giving off an alarm signal, a warning signal. Now, moving on to the skull, you can't help but notice these fantastic curved incisors at the front of the head. Like all rodents, these teeth carry on growing throughout its lifetime. But cleverly, if you look closely, the rear dentine is softer at the back than the enamel at the front. And that means when the beaver is chewing, the rear of the tooth will wear down more quickly than the front, resulting in a chisel-shaped tooth, which is perfect for chopping wood. Also, if you look at the back, you'll see these flattened grinding teeth, which are ideal for dealing with cut materials and processing them. Beavers are herbivores, um, and they do not eat fish, as is sometimes mistakenly thought. Uh, their diet varies throughout the season, but they'll feed on aquatic plants, herbs, grasses. They'll also, of course, eat leaves, twigs, and bark. But the majority of their diet is made up of tree bark, and the cambium layer just underneath the tree bark. Common feeding signs include coppiced tree stumps, felled trees. Um, you can also see gnawed stumps and beaver chips scattered around those north stumps. Beavers are social animals with a social group usually consisting of a pair of adults and two litters of two to three kits from the current and previous year. Of course beavers are well known for their building skills and they have long prehensile fingers on their front paws which aren't webbed unlike the rear uh, and these are ideal for grasping, manipulating and moving materials around. And of course beavers are most famous for building dams um, which restrict water flow. Um, this is ideal for the beaver because it will create a pond behind the dam which is an ideal habitat for that beaver to exploit. The beavers will build their lodge on the pond, on the bank side as well, of an island. Um, and a lodge very often has an underwater entrance for privacy, uh, a food storage area and above the water within the lodge you will find sleeping um, chambers as well. Building materials are generally logs, felled trees, branches and mud, also for packing and insulation. Beavers then are natural engineers with a unique ability to manage an environment to create a new wetland habitat, which they can then exploit. That wetland habitat also benefits other wildlife, including fish, aquatic invertebrates, pond plants, wetland species. And in effect, that means that the beaver is a keystone species. All those other species depend upon the beaver being there, the presence of the beaver. 
Remove the beaver and you could see a negative impact on that environment and in extreme cases ecosystem collapse. Hi, I'm Jill Dowse, I'm the Knowledge and Evidence Manager at the Scottish Wildlife Trust and I'm lucky enough to have been working with beavers for the Trust for the last 10 years. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Scottish Beaver Trial, uh, which is a partnership project between the Scottish Wildlife Trust, the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, Forestry and Land Scotland and Scottish Natural Heritage. We were lucky enough to have fantastic funding from the People's Postcode Lottery, BIFA and the People's Trust for Endangered Species to help us with this important work. So the trial was an independently monitored scientific trial that ran for five years to really see what happened uh, with beavers back in Scotland's landscape after so long. Whilst the trial was underway, it became clear that there were now beavers living wild on Tayside, whether from escapes or illegal releases we don't know. But reports then started dating back to 2002 for these animals. This unregulated and unmonitored population grew, uh, and more on them later. In 2002, the Tayside Beaver Study Group was set up. The trial involved 16 animals from Norway being released in five families. The site was picked because of its ecological suitability, it had a lot of lochs and streams for the beavers to live in, and fantastic herbaceous and woody material for the beavers to feed on. It had uncomplicated land management, the whole area was owned by Forestry and Land Scotland. It also had extensive forest tracks and visitor facilities and office space which all made it a useful place to try and hold the trial. One of the key things for the area to be selected for the trial was its contained catchment. So that meant the geography and the geomorphology of the area acted like a, almost like a, a fence to hold the animals in. So while these were wild animals, we were seeing how they would react in the wild, there was less chance of them moving out into the wider landscape. So those 16 beavers were released. Each pair had one to three kits. We saw some territorial changes where animals actually switched which um, families they belonged to. Uh, there were three deaths of animals recorded during the trial. Five animals went missing. And in 2017, when we came back to do a follow-up survey, nine animals were known to be remaining in Napdale. One of the 31 license conditions for the trial was that there was independent monitoring in place and that this should be coordinated by Scottish Natural Heritage. There was a huge range of independent monitoring partners that helped bring all this research together. And that research covered beaver ecology, beaver health, fish ecology, woodland habitat changes, biodiversity change, hydrology, socioeconomics, public health and scheduled monuments. And the Scottish Beaver Trial team collected a huge amount of data through the trial which fed into all of those streams of, of information. The outcomes of all of the monitoring work was brought together by Scottish Natural Heritage in Beavers in Scotland report in 2015 and that's available online and it's a fantastic resource. That was presented to Scottish ministers uh, with four scenarios of what would happen to the beavers in Napdale, from removal, restrict restricted range, widespread natural recolonisation or accelerated colonisation. We saw some great changes to the, to the landscape in Napdale during the trial and the most significant of those was the dam that the animals put in place on the Dulock just off the Coolivar Lock. And that created uh, 13,000 square metres of new wetland habitat. And this is amazing mosaic habitat. And I've been really lucky to see how that's progressed through the years. Um, initially, it was, it was all very wet and there's a lot of standing trees. Um, no slowly, the standing trees in the water slowly died, uh, giving huge amounts of deadwood habitat for invertebrates and um, amphibians and so forth and obviously that's had knock-on effects with the the bird species and bats and things that have all been using the site um, and as the years have gone on and the beavers have moved away from using that particular loch it's really settled into the landscape and it's now a beautiful beaver meadow the water levels have sunk um, and the habitat has changed and the, and the makeup of the species has really changed there it's fantastic to go and see on the 24th of November 2016, the Scottish Ministers took the landmark decision to allow beavers to remain in Scotland. And they started work towards securing European protected species status. This was the first ever mammal reintroduction to the UK.
So when they made that announcement in 2016, they clarified that beavers' populations in Argyll and Tayside could remain, and they would be allowed to expand their range naturally. They should be actively managed to minimise impacts, and it remains an offence to release a wild beaver without a licence, and that uh, you can get up to two years in prison for that. Fast forward to the 1st of May 2019, where European protected species status came into force in Scotland, and beavers were a part of the natural landscape once more. The Scottish Beavers Partners held a celebration event because this was a monumental occasion in the history of beavers in Scotland. From that European protected species status, it is now an offence to deliberately capture or kill a wild beaver, disturb a wild beaver, damage or destroy a breeding site or resting place of a wild beaver. Any of those actions must be licensed. And the licence must not impact on the favourable conservation status of the species. So back to those animals in Tayside. They've now been seen as far as Crean Larrick in the west to Forfara in the east. And estimates on the number of the animals in Tayside are about 450 from a widespread survey by Rasheen Campbell Palmer et al in 2017-2018. That looked like a doubling of numbers since the previous survey in 2012. The Tayside Angus area is obviously much larger than Knapdale and with ex extensive areas of low-lying farmland, there's real possibility for conflict with land managers. The extent and significance of impacts will depend on the local topography, soil structure, hydrology, and the vulnerability of the affected interests. Although we think there were around 450 beavers in 2017-18, we assume that there was a rise in lethal control of beavers in the run-up to the European Protected Species status in 2019. So we're really keen that there's further survey to see exactly where the beavers are now. Bringing back beavers is a significant success story. These animals are one of the world's best natural engineers with an incredible ability to create new wetlands, restore woodlands and improve conditions for a wide range of species. As the trial area at Knapdale was never set up to be a founding population, it was unlikely to grow and achieve the goal of being one of the sites from which natural colonisation could take place. So the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and the Scottish Wildlife Trust once again went through the process of applying for a licence through the Scottish Code for Translocation and were issued with a new three-year licence to reinforce the population in Knapdale with up to 28 animals over a three-year period. We hope to increase the genetic diversity of the Knapdale population too. We'd used Norwegian animals back in 2009, but science had moved on and it seemed that the Bavarian stock might be more robust. So to mix these stocks, we took animals from projects in England and from conflict areas in Tayside as part of this reintroduction. We're doing much less monitoring for this project than we did through the trial as beavers are now wild animals and allowed to remain in Scotland. Most significantly, we're doing extensive camera trap work with our partners, the Heart of Argyle Wildlife Organisation, a local organisation that does beaver walks and talks in Knapdale, and I can highly recommend a visit. That camera footage allows us to see which areas are in use by the beavers, and more importantly, in some cases, which animals are where. So what for the future of beavers in Scotland? Well, we're still really learning a lot about how beavers live in Scotland. Here's some footage from our Lock of Lyles Reserve near Dunkeld, where otters can seem, be seen to be very interested in their new neighbours. There is potential that they could predate on kits, and there is some research planned in this area. With beavers now being a protected species, and widespread throughout Tayside and Angus, the biggest test for them is management with human conflicts. Beavers in the wrong places can cause significant damage, especially to low-lying agricultural land by damming and flooding areas. There are a range of mitigation measures available to allow us to relearn to live with beavers once more. The best approach to take when looking at beaver management is look at a catchment scale. We work closely with a diverse range of interests from the Scottish Beaver Forum across farming, forestry and fishing and we are committed to working closely to, for a positive future for beavers in Scotland. We want to see lethal control 
firmly remain as a last resort and to advocate for further releases throughout Scotland on the edge of current catchments between Knapdale and the Tayside populations and further away from areas of prime agricultural land where their benefits can be better felt. The beavers are back, the first ever mammal reintroduction to the UK. We have fulfilled a moral obligation to return a keystone species that was lost due to human influences. We are not complacent though. After a 400 year absence, you cannot expect to bring back a species which modifies its habitats as beavers do, without there being some controversy and issues which need to be resolved. That's why we're so actively engaged in developing and supporting the management approach and the education work which needs to continue.